The following is a presentation of the Steamboat Church of Christ in Steamboat Springs, Colorado. We hope that you find today's lesson presented by our minister, Dr. Joseph Becker, informative, insightful, and inspirational. One of the conversations that I've had with a number of people repeatedly over the years has to do with the question of what is natural and what is other than natural. Some of you may recall a lesson I gave quite some time back, number 30 in the Life of Christ series, almost 11 years ago, Betty Crocker and the Antichrist. And in that sermon, I outlined what one would have to do and the links to which one would have to go to make one batch of biscuits truly from scratch. Now, the illustration that I used was borderline ridiculous. Indeed, it may have crossed the line. The other side of the border, as I outlined just how long it would take and how much effort would be required if one were to undertake such an endeavor. Because even if you started with advanced knowledge of metallurgy, xylology, animal husbandry, agriculture, oleology, fungology, lactology, and the culinary arts, it would take at least 40 years to accomplish the task of producing one batch of biscuits truly from scratch. The thing is, however, that when you get done, your end product, your batch of biscuits, would still not be considered natural by many, at least not by the definition of natural used by many, many people, because biscuits do not occur in nature. No, biscuits are by definition man-made. And according to many purists, anything man-made is non-natural. Because too many, humankind is not part of nature. Now, as I understand the matter, this point of view is somewhat unscientific. Because last I checked, which was yesterday, scientifically speaking, a human being is any warm-blooded mammal of the family hominidae characterized by superior intelligence, articulate speech, and erect carriage. And humankind is considered part of the natural order, at least taxonomically speaking. So where does the popular notion that humankind is other than natural come from? Well, I don't know for certain, but I have a theory. I think this point of view that humans are other than natural is actually a product of natural revelation. For the last several weeks, we've been considering John 16, 12, where Jesus said, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. And in light of this passage, we've been talking about revelation from God that has come to us since the ascension of Christ. And we've covered the topics of special revelation, the revelation of Holy Scripture, and of personal illumination, the private leadings and insights that come to us individually as Christians, courtesy of the Holy Spirit. And now we're in the midst of a discussion about natural revelation. In Romans 1, 18-20, Paul says, For the disposition of God in regard to every kind of secularism and unrighteousness of the human race, specifically in regard to those who suppress the truth for the sake of unrighteousness, is made evident in the environment itself. For what may be known about God is evident to everyone, because God has made it evident to everyone. For since the creation of the universe... His invisible attributes, His eternal power, and His divine nature have been readily perceptible in the things that have been made. Thus, they have no defense. <clears throat> and among the things that Paul reveals to us in this passage is the knowledge that the data set presented to us in this created universe testifies truthfully and reliably. Indeed, according to Paul, the testimony of the created order is trustworthy even when it testifies about heavenly things. And according to Jesus in John 3.12, a witness whose testimony about heavenly things is reliable can certainly be trusted to testify truthfully about earthly things. And as such, it would seem that we're required by Scripture itself to receive the testimony of natural revelation as truthful and reliable in all matters to which it speaks. And in every culture, in every age, since the beginning of recorded history, there has been a near universal assent that humankind, though clearly animalian in nature, is just as clearly in a class by itself 
among other creatures on the earth. Now, this isn't an absolute universal. No, there, there are a number of post-civilization cultures in which it is held that human beings are but a variation on the theme of all beings in general, and that the qualities of being human are merely incidental. And if you light some incense and say that in hushed tones and in broken English to the accompanying sound of wood flute or whale song or hoof beats or distant drums or whatever it takes to cause your audience to detach themselves from reality, you can make a pretty good case for that. And if altering the environment doesn't do the trick, just throw in a few hallucinogenics to alter the mind. That ought to get the job done. But in the main, wherever the human psyche has remained tethered to reality, it has been the broad consensus among those who make serious study of anthropology, based on things such as raw intelligence, complexity of thought, self-awareness, the ability to experience pain and pleasure, the complex use of both spoken and written language, and the power uh, to both formulate complex ideas and to translate those ideas with one, uh, into executable actions, both in isolation and in cooperation with one another, that human beings are unique among all other beings that inhabit this planet. And this assessment of the human animal is largely the product of natural revelation. And this is the appraisal of humankind that has traditionally been maintained in the church. And one of the reasons for that, apart from the fact that it's demonstrably true on any number of planes, is because this point of view is corroborated in the Bible. This point of view is corroborated by special revelation. In Genesis 1.26, we read, And God said, Let us make humankind in our image, and after our likeness let, us, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and the birds of the heavens, the cattle, and, all, and over all the earth, even over every creeping thing that crawls on the earth. According to the Bible, by divine fiat, by God's command, Human beings are set apart from other beings on the earth, at least to the degree that in God's estimation it is appropriate for human beings to have dominion over all the other beings on the earth. Now, that raises a number of questions that we will not be going into in this lesson. Most notably, it raises the question of the scope of humankind's dominion over the earth how that dominion is to be exercised, and what responsible earth stewardship looks like. But for the purposes of today's lesson, I'm much more interested in talking about the basis upon which God rested his judgment, that humankind, and not some other species of creature, ought to be given dominion over the earth. What quality is it in human beings that gave God confidence in us to act as stewards over his creation? Well, according to this same verse of Scripture, the factor in the makeup of human beings that sets us apart from other beings and that is identified as the aspect of our Constitution that qualifies us to be stewards of the earth is the image of God. This is what sets humankind apart from the other animals. Now, in 2 Peter 1.20, Peter tells us that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. And one of the things we declare from this, or that we deduce from this passage, is that no doctrine of Scripture should be based on any single verse of the Bible. At least two verses, and preferably more than that, are required for any statement of Scripture to be developed into a fully orbed doctrine. And this applies to the doctrine of the image of God as well. In Acts 17, 26 through 29, Paul addressing the philosophers at the Areopagus on Mars Hill in Athens, said, From one man he made every nation of men, that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he determined the time set for them and the exact places where they should live. God did this so that men would seek him and perhaps, perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For it is in him that we live and move. And have our being, as even some of your own poets have said, surely 
we are his offspring. If God's offspring we are, then we ought not to think that the, that the divine being is like gold or civil or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. Now, when Paul said this, he did so in response to the fact that as he had observed, the city of Athens was filled with idols of every kind, in every form. Indeed, Paul comments that the Athenians were so superstitious that they had built an altar to the unknown God, for fear that there be a God that they had left out of their pantheon. And what he was telling the men of Athens was that this made no sense in light of their belief that human beings are the offspring of God. Because if we are uniquely the offspring of God, then He ought to bear more resemblance to us than to any form that an artist can fashion from gold or silver or stone. Now, that statement, at least as I understand the matter, was not intended by Paul to tell the Athenians something about humankind, but rather to tell them something about God. But in the process of telling them about the nature of God, he reveals something about us. And what he reveals is that in spite of the fall, the image of God, the Father, imprinted upon us at the creation has remained intact in us, at least to the degree that it is recognizable in us to him. And quite apparently, it remains recognizable to us to a sufficient degree that that is the very thing that continues to distinguish us from any other creature that lives on the earth, real or imaginary. Which is to say that human beings, even in our sinful condition, still bear more resemblance to God than do kittens, puppies, bunnies, pandas, baby seals, unicorns, elves, sprites, or the Navi. And this sets us apart from other creatures. Not just categorically, but ontologically, in our very beings. In Genesis 9, 2 through 6, after the flood, God said to Noah, as the representative of all humankind on earth at that time, the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth and upon every bird of the heavens, upon everything that creeps on the ground and all the fish of the sea, for I am delivering them all into your hands. Every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. Just as I gave you the green plants, I now give you everything. However, you shall not eat flesh with its life, that is, its blood, still in it. For, and... For your lifeblood I will require a reckoning. From every beast I will require it, and from man. From his fellow man I will require a reckoning for the life of a man. Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. For God made man in his own image. And by these words God made a clear distinction between the human animal and all other animals on the earth. Because here he extends the dominion of humankind over the animals to their very lives. I am giving them into your hands, God says, that you may kill and eat. And this privilege God heightens to an imperative in Acts 10.13, when he shows all the animals of the earth to Peter and says to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But to the animals in Genesis 9, God says, If any of you takes the life of a human being, there will be a reckoning. You will have to pay for that life with your own life. Which is why, as I understand the matter, in almost every country in the world, even in places where the word of God is held in utter contempt, it is both the law of the land and the will of the people that any animal that takes the life of a human being must be put down. At least this has been so historically, because historically there's been no question that animal life is of lesser value ontologically than human life. That is, until recent decades, 
when growing numbers of people have been advocating not just that animals should be treated more humanely, but also that animals should be granted the same rights as humans. Now, as I said before, along with the privilege of dominion over the earth comes the responsibility of stewardship of the earth, and as such, I am persuaded that we are charged by God to be responsible, compassionate, thoughtful, and even zealous in our care for the earth and all of her inhabitants. But that does not mean elevating the animals to a status equal to that of ourselves. Sometime back, after narrowly missing a deer on 40 between here and Hayden, I commented to someone that Darwin must be falling down on the job producing a smarter deer by natural selection. And this road has been here for at least 130 years, and for the last century it has had motor vehicles traveling on it. So for no fewer than 80 servoid generations, the deer population by natural selection ought to be getting progressively more and more savvy when it comes to crossing the highway. But, I complained, because of their persistent ineptitude at crossing the street, they put my life in danger on a daily basis. And the man I was speaking with, who was also a Christian, said, well, the deer were here long before that road was built. Who says that your life is any more precious than theirs? And my response was swift and decisive. Jesus. <laughs> that's who says that my life is more precious than that of any animal. At least that's what I take him to mean. In Matthew 10, 31, where he says, So do not fear. You are more valuable than, any, than many sparrows. Well, more valuable in what sense? Well, more valuable in a sense that is meaningful to God. And make no mistake about it, this is something that is meaningful to God. As a matter of fact, even after the fall, God, who restrains sin in the world, made a special effort to keep the sin of the world from corrupting our self-image. Because He wanted us to see ourselves as we are as creatures that are the imperfect but veritable image of Himself, our Creator, imprinted on our very beings. But as sin advanced in the world, humankind saw fit to corrupt the image of God. And once that imprint, though it remained, had been robbed of its power to inform us of what and who God intended us to be, he removed his restraint against sin and allowed the sinful nature at work within us to corrupt even our knowledge of ourselves. That's what Paul tells us in Romans 1, 21 through 28. <clears throat> For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore, God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the Creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions, for their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to their original nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another, men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. For since they had not seen fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what, not, what ought not to be done. Now, Paul does not tell us exactly when this happened, though it seems apparent that this was very early on in human history. It was certainly prior to Genesis 18 and the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, but it may have been as early as Genesis 6 when human women began having unnatural relations with the sons of God. Either way, the point for today's lesson is the same, because today's lesson isn't about sexual sin. 
No, today's lesson is about the image of God imprinted upon the very beings of humankind in the act of creation. And what Paul tells us in Romans 1 is that for the greatest part of recorded human history, that image of God, though still recognizable to him, has been obscured from our eyes as a consequence of idolatry. But in 2 Corinthians 3, 15-18, he tells us that in the transactions of salvation, we are being liberated from the darkened minds that once prevented us from seeing God clearly, and ourselves clearly, and that as a consequence, the image of God is one of the things that is being restored in those who are being saved. Yes, to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts, but when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. After all, the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberation. Thus we all, with unveiled face, behold, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this is what proceeds from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Beloved, God couldn't have put it any more plainly, humankind is ontologically set apart from the rest of creation as the unique bearers of the imprint of the image of God. And as such, we are different both in sum and substance from the other animals. That's why Genesis 1.26 is so vitally important to Christian theology. Because in order to have a clear understanding of where we are going, we have to have a clear understanding of where we have been. And according to this verse of Scripture, when God first created us, He said, Let us make humankind in our image and after our likeness. Humankind is the noblest of all species on the earth bearing from the very beginning the image of our Creator in our very beings, in a way unique to us and distinct from all other creatures. And that is a fact of which I am certain. And that brings us to where we left off last week. As you may recall, last week we were discussing the origins of the human species, focusing our attention on Genesis 2-7 where Moses tells us, The Lord God formed humankind from the dust of the earth. And I pointed out that in this verse, the Hebrew word that's translated dust is the word afar. Which word, when it is taken as a collective singular, means dust or powder or anything pulverized or deconstructed? Begging the question, deconstructed into what? Leading me to point out that when afar is taken as a collective plural, it means particles, units, material of the earth, the components, substance, ingredients, or elements of the creation. And this casts new light on passages such as Proverbs 8, 24-26, where wisdom incarnate, who many people believe to be God the Son, says, I was there, dancing, before the deep existed, before the springs ran with water, before the mountains were settled, before the hills were formed. I was there, dancing, when he made the earth, outer space, and the afar that make up the universe. Likewise, Genesis 3.19, where God tells Adam, for afar thou art, and unto afar shalt thou return. Because in this verse, as also in Job 17.16, Psalm 104.29, Ecclesiastes 3.20, and Daniel 12.2, what the Bible tells us is that the elements that go into the composition of a human body are the same as the elements that come out of the decomposition of a human body. Because while... At the time that Moses wrote the book of Genesis, some 3,500 years ago, the integration of the human body at the beginning of the life cycle was beyond the scope of observation. The disintegration of the human body at the end of the life cycle was not. Decomposition is an easily observable phenomenon. And according to Genesis 3.19, the raw materials that make up a human body 
are the same on both ends of the life cycle. And according to the science of that day, when a human body decomposes after death, before the flesh dries to a consistency that easily crumbles into powder, the decaying body yields fluids, heat, and gas. Which is why, in the ancient Hebrew mind, the afar which make up the human body were considered to be the four basic elements of which every living creature on earth is made. Earth, water, air, and fire. Fire being a general term for energy. So that when Moses tells us in Genesis 2-7 that God created humankind from the afar of the earth, what he's telling us is that Adam was made from the elements of the earth, the material of the earth, the substance of the earth. And this would seem to be confirmed in Psalm 139, 13-16, where David says, For you formed my inward parts, you knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My constitution was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, curiously wrought from the most basic elements of the earth, and your eyes beheld my unformed substance. Now, if you want to hear more about that, I invite you to go online and listen to last week's lesson there, number 34 in this series, The Elements of the Earth. For the purposes of today's lesson, it's sufficient to note that based on the research I did for last week's lesson, I am persuaded that afar is the stuff of which the bodies of human beings are made. All the stuff. All the stuff of which your body and mine are made and all the stuff of which Adam's body was made, which when broken down in, into its constituent parts would, to the mind of Moses, very likely have been understood by him as the four basic elements, earth, water, air, and fire. Or to put it another way, afar was the ancient Hebrew, as the ancient Hebrew seemed to have understood that word, refers to the numerous substances of which all living things are made, the basic building blocks of all organic life. So that once again, it is demonstrated that no truth revealed to us through natural revelation, if it is truth, should contradict with any truth revealed to us in the pages of Holy Scripture. In the end, even though the two may be in tension for a time, they will always prove to be in agreement in the final analysis. However, having said that, when you put last week's lesson together with the first half of today's lesson, we're still left with two more questions to answer on this matter. First, if the afar of the earth of which the body of Adam was made is the same as the basic building blocks of which all organic life is made, then how is it that human beings are ontologically different from all other beings on the earth? Where does the image of God come into this equation? By what means did the human race receive the imprint of the image of God on our very beings? Well, the image of God comes to bear on the beings of humankind by the other element, Moses tells us about in Genesis 2-7, the element that is not one of the elements of the earth, the breath of life. Then the Lord God formed humankind from the elements of the earth, and when he breathed the breath of life into its nostrils, the creature of dust became a living soul, a human being. The creation of Adam was a two-step process. The first step in the process involved the formation of a creature of dust, a creature of afar, a creature made of the same elements of the earth of which all organic life on earth is made. But that creature of dust was not Adam. The creature of dust was not a human being. A human being is a living soul, a dichotomous creature made up of two distinct parts integrated together into one being a human body, and a human spirit. And the two together make up a living soul, a human being. 
A spiritless body is not a living soul. A spiritless body is a zombie. And a bodiless spirit is not a living soul. A bodiless spirit is a ghost. Only an integrated human being is a living soul. Because a soul is a human life. A whole human life. A human body and a human spirit. Both created in the womb. <clears throat> that was the case for Adam. And that's the case for every one of us. First, we are conceived as bodies, as David pronounces in Psalm 139, 13 through 16, which I read a moment ago. And then, when our human bodies are ready to host a human spirit, God creates our spirits within our bodies. As we read in Zechariah 12, 1, the Lord forms the spirit of a man within him. Thus, even though, as I understand the matter, God does not perform a nascent act of creation of the type He performed when He first created Adam without benefit of a womb. Nevertheless, the formation of every human being follows the same basic pattern as did the creation of Adam. Genesis 2.7, Then the Lord God formed humankind from the elements of the earth, and when He breathed the breath of life into its nostrils, the creature of dust became a living soul. A human being. So as I understand the matter, the image of God is imprinted on us not through the elements of the earth, but through the breath of life, breathed into each of us by God Himself. And as such, the scientific finding that our bodies are made up of the same building blocks as those of all other living things does not, in my estimation, contradict the well-established biblical doctrine that the human species stands apart from all other species and that we and we alone are created in the image of God. Putting it plainly, the latest findings in evolutionary biology, at least in regard to the commonality between the building blocks that make up humans and the building blocks that make up other animals, does no violence to the basic foundation upon which biblical ideals biblical ideals of human dignity are based. This is simply not a problem. And that leaves us with only one question left to answer. And that is, well then what are we to make of the evidence that humankind and simian kind are descended from common ancestors? And that is no small question. As I pointed out to you last week, Quoting my friend, Dr. James Durbin, who was one of the pioneers who worked on the Human Genome Project, he said to me, as for the DNA evidence of common ancestry, you should know it's pretty good. It's not just that, say, human and chimp genomes are very similar. We look similar, and similar things should be expected to have similar plans. No, what makes the evidence gripping is that the human and the, chim is that the, human and the chimpanzee genomes share common errors. About 9% of your genome is the remains of ancient retroviral infections. Viral DNA inserted into the human germline and passed on. It doesn't do anything useful. The striking thing is that we share this evidence of past viral infections with chimpanzees. We know from other experiments that these viruses insert their DNA more or less randomly in the genome and that that pattern of insertion events is shared. There are other things, evidence that human chromosome 2 is a fusion of ancestral chromosomes, the loss of the GLO gene, which is why pirates and their monkeys, but not ship rats, get scurvy. <coughs> but there are thousands of retroviral insertions, so it's more compelling in total. I mention this to say my recommendation, my recommendation to Christians is brace yourselves. And indeed, I think we should brace ourselves. And I'm of the opinion that the best way to brace ourselves is to be progressive in every sense of the truest sense of the word progressive, which is that we should take the initiative as good stewards of both special revelation and natural revelation and prepare ourselves to make a response. And when I say response, I do not mean retort. No, 
When truth wins, we win. In Proverbs 15, 1 through 2, we're told, A soft answer turneth away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. The tongue of the wise uses knowledge aright. We're not looking for a grudge match. We're pursuing the reconciliation of diverging truths. In 1 Peter 3.15, Peter charges us, saying, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man who asks you a reason for the hope that is within you with meekness and fear. And I take that seriously. Special revelation and natural revelation ought to speak with one voice. One harmonious voice. And whatever they don't, I think it's perfectly reasonable for Christians and non-Christians alike to ask, why not? So is there a reasonable way to reconcile the DNA data with the biblical data while remaining faithful to the truth? <laughs> revealed in both. Come back next week and I'll tell you. That's my lesson for today. This has been a presentation of the Steamboat Church of Christ. We hope that you have found Dr. Becker's message well appointed. To hear more lessons like this one, visit our website at www.steamboatchurch.org or come see us at 1698 Lincoln Avenue in Steamboat Springs, Colorado. Bible classes are Sunday mornings at 9.30, and worship services are at 10.30. We look forward to meeting you. Until then, may the grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you.